in February 2018, a little movie that could premiered on the big screen. Yeah, I couldn't get a ticket on Thursday. That shit go. But it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I'll be there Friday, though. This film went on to be a cultural moment in pop culture history. Talk was everywhere. Reviews were everywhere. Merchandise, costumes, baked goods. Yes, baked goods. All of this from a comic book movie, a Marvel movie, at a time when talk of superhero fatigue was really gaining steam and traction. This movie came out at just the right time to get us hyped for Infinity War and give us all the hope in the world that 2018 was going to be an amazing year for film. It wasn't. And nearly one year later, the nominees for the 2019 Academy Awards were announced. And it was on the list for Best Picture. And then this happened. I'm upset. Black Panther, while a good movie, is not best picture material, and people need to stop you treating stop it like crap, that. right? It, it, it's it's about what the best picture is, not for what it stands culturally. Even though Blade was a much better superhero and was a black I like character. the movie, but the movie is the most overrated movie of you all really time. You sit there and think of all the movies in 2018, and look at Black Panther and go, "Yeah, that belongs to be there." Oh, we sweet, adorable children. To say that Black Panther's nomination is pandering is blasphemy to me because I think that Black Panther is genius in about a hundred ways that most people don't seem to talk about. The cultural impact is always cited and never overlooked, but do you know what has been overlooked? The entire movie. That or I you know, just watch movies weird, but I think that this movie has earned its Oscar nomination. Let's do this! So, please don't knock over my heart. Black Panther was a 2018 film from Marvel Studios, a subsidiary of Disney. Yep, we paid the mouse for this one. It was directed by Ryan Coogler and starring Chadwick Boseman and Michael B. Jordan, making this the third team up between Coogler and B. Jordan, an era that I'm sure will be known as the B. Coogs era. Or the Rachel B. Coogan era. Other bit players in this movie include a motley crew composed of Angela Bassett, Letitia Wright, Forrest Whitaker, Lapita Nyong'o, Andy Serkis, Denai Guerrera, Daniel Kaluuya, Sterling K. Brown, and Martin Freeman. Oh, and over half this cast, by the way, signed on to be in this movie before reading word one of the script because they heard Ryan Coogler was making this movie. Anticipation was high for this film right out of the gate. As soon as Black Panther was introduced in Captain America Civil War, and especially after the solo film was announced, the countdown was on. It became the new what up for a while. But the problem that I personally had with the hype of this was the whole Marvel moviness of it all. Look, for the first several years to basically now, Marvel had a certain formula with these movies. The sequels can deviate a little, but the first movies in the solo field always felt the same. Hero is introduced, acquires or begins quest to reacquire powers, finds his Scooby gang, Big Bad is introduced, gets trounced, comes back and triumphs over Big Bad, You've been called always humor time. thrown in. What do you say to that? Absolutely ridiculous, I don't think. Ever is there irony in the superhero-ness of it all. Mostly it's fun and to be fair to a degree, Black Panther is no exception to the formula. But what this film does, what it succeeds at doing and exceeds expectations in doing, is being deep as fuck while doing it. It is most certainly the whiz-bang awesomeness that we've all come to expect from a Marvel movie, but simultaneously it is also a quiet contemplation on a world that colonialism has wrought through homogenization and the ramifications of doing so. How do you think your ancestors got these? You think they paid a fair price? Or did they take it like they took everything else? This movie had something to say. 
Our hype gave it a platform, and it used said platform to smack us over the head with satires and indictments of colonialism and systematic racism, politics, yeah. sexism, feminism. It's nice. Just we bit back and forth, man. What? It's a disgrace. And weird ass sandals. All the while making over $700 million domestically at the box office. That is more than Titanic. And worldwide, this movie made more than and two other movies that had Black Panther in them. Dear freaking God. But first, let's talk about them women, though. Black Panther is more feminist than Wonder Woman. There, I said it. It's out there for you all to get mad at me about, but I am not taking it back. Instead, allow me to extrapolate for just one moment. Wakanda is obviously a country of equality, not a patriarchy, not a matriarchy. Hey there, Queenie! I like that shiny hat. Where they sell that at? The honor guard of Wakanda, the best fighters in the land, is a force composed entirely of women. Badass women who could legit kick your ass. But here's the rub. You cannot just stick a woman in a role, remove what makes her female, and just call it feministic. That's just a gender swap in that case. And I'm looking at you, Arya Stark. No, seriously, like, I'm watching you. We're rooting for you. One season left to go. Hashtag for the throne. But these women don't do that. Okoye, the leader of the Royal Guard, is more than just a guard, warrior, and confidant. She is also a wife, having several scenes of her showing her interaction My with her husband, My love. himself the leader of one of the seven tribes of Wakanda. She is not remanded to being nothing more than a warrior, filling a traditionally male-held role. Nor is she remanded to the role of a queen or companion. She is a fully fleshed out, fully realized character with a family, job, code of honor. Would you kill me, my love? For Wakanda? She even tells her husband where to stick it and battles against him for her principles of what is right and what is wrong. Even some of the elders and leaders of the tribes of Wakanda are women, like her. I mean, I don't think she has a name in the credits, but I'm gonna call her Ethel. And what about Mildred here? Can somebody check the credits? Um, do these elders have names? Or am I just being mean? I don't know. And how about Shuri, a young prodigious girl who is also the chief scientist of Wakanda. She's fun, feisty, spunky, badass, all woman, all awesome. Shuri might have eked out as my favorite character if it wasn't for the fatigue clad awesome sauce of a human being Michael B still in the show, but I'll get to him in just a minute. Shuri, being an obvious intellectual rival to Tony Stark, became a fantastic source of comic relief in this otherwise heavy as balls movie. Scare me like that colonizer. Calling Martin Freeman a colonizer might have been the best line in this movie. Next to this, actually. What are those? Dude, it never gets old. The colonizer line is meant to be a fun and funny, albeit slightly reversed racist jab, but it carries all the weight of a social commentary as well. Freeman, though playing an American, the actor also being British, in the continent of Africa, which was colonized and exploited by both of those countries, both America and England. That line being used as a jab is a sick as hell burn, especially as she schools him, but that takes us directly to Andy Serkis as Ulysses Claw was a perfect move. His over the top acting made him a compelling villain while never getting too far into the realm of cartoony. But there's more to his presence than meets the eye. Being a white South African who stole vibranium from Wakanda, perfectly mirroring the pillaging and exploitation of Africa by the honky ass Pekka Woods, while simultaneously being a symbolic representation of apartheid. You see what I'm talking about? This movie has more layers than a blooming onion at Outback Steakhouse, which itself is a... Okay, we are in the weeds now. We are in the weeds. Damn. I want to look at costuming here for just one second. Blue. Wait, no, that, that, that wasn't an invitation for a song change here. No, uh, fine, we'll, we'll keep it. 
Blue in this film represents colonialism. And I'm not making that up, that is not me stretching. There is an amazing interview that you can find online that Ryan Coogler did with Vanity Fair, where he breaks down the club fight scene, shot by shot, color by color. He discusses how they do the amazing swinging camera shots that made that fight so epic. And in it, he breaks down the color choices in the movie and how blue represents colonialism in this universe. Colonialism and its aftermath. Those consequences and repercussions, those are the true villains of this movie. And yeah, I'm going to stick by that because without that, Killmonger ain't got no reason to kill Mong. What? This movie directly asks the question of its audience. What have we lost and what have we created by destroying and homogenizing cultures throughout history? And then it pushes the question even further by asking what those countries would look like if they were allowed to survive and thrive into modern times. And then it gives us the indictment and the repercussion side by misdirecting us. We're led to believe that we're gonna get Claws, our big bad, and then we're smacked in the face by Killmonger, a villain who has been compared more times than I'd care to count to Heath Ledger's Joker. All right, let's stop for one second here for me to give you my personal opinion. Heath Ledger's Joker is, to me, one of the greatest performances in film. And I emphasize this because I want that statement about Killmonger being on a level with the Joker to carry the appropriate weight. Because even though I don't think the performances were on the same level, one being Metal Gear and one being Dark Souls, for instance, both are franchises and games, frankly, that I love. One does not need to be equal in every regard to have a comparison. But my ancestors that jumped from the ships, because they knew death was better than bombs. So you want a comparison? And here we go. So you want a comparison? Fine. Both films, The Dark Knight and Black Panther, are essentially about two forces, a protagonist and an antagonist, with completely different and valid viewpoints. The respective films then juxtapose the protagonist and antagonist while explaining the mindsets of both, leaving the perception of good and evil, right and wrong, in the hands of the viewer. Want a plot summary to drive my point home? Both of these films are about a titular character, a misunderstood and secretive protagonist who fights tooth and nail against a nemesis who appears seemingly out of nowhere over their closely held beliefs about society and justice. I'd say that that plot perfectly sums up both movies without getting into specifics, right? Okay, comparisons drawn. Oh, I'm sorry, maybe I should have explained things. The titular protagonists in these films aren't Batman and T'Challa. They're the Joker and Killmonger. Oh! What motivates these characters? Well, in the case of Black Panther, Killmonger, excuse me, the reasonings may be oblique, but they're still on display. He seeks retribution and vindication for the injustices done to the black community both throughout history and in the present day. And by that, I don't just mean slavery and segregation here. I'm referring to systematic oppression, police brutality, and also redlining, which by the way is a system of unfair government loan policies which force blacks to live in ghettos, and also increased poverty in predominantly black neighborhoods which contribute to mass incarcerations. In other words, he's looking to flip-flop the status quo and right the wrongs forced upon the masses from the oppressors, i.e. those in power. What does the Joker want? What is he looking for? Uh, actually, basically the same thing. Notice the people that Mr. J takes out while trying to make Batman, a masked vigilante who works outside the law and answers to no one, reveal himself. Who are his targets throughout the movie? I'll give you a hint. He's not exactly going after Joe Blow nobody. Police, organized crime, judges, commissioners, people in power who hold the power and may, in cases, willfully wield said power to oppress and terrorize. Both motivations are expressly spelled out in such obvious terms that they are on display for all to see and offer the subtext for these films to pivot its main conflict on, the juxtaposition of viewpoints on how to right these injustices. Speaking of juxtaposition, you know what both of these films do masterfully? Juxtapose the ideals and goals of the protagonist and antagonist against each other. Yes, I'm using that word a lot. Don't at me, man. I have a vocabulary. Batman and the Joker being two sides of the same coin. 
lawlessness versus lawlessness, with different ideals on how society should work. T'Challa and Killmonger do it differently by utilizing false dichotomy, or absolutism. Isolationism versus colonialism. Traditionalism versus progress. T'Challa is fine hiding Wakanda as all the other leaders have done before him, while Killmonger wants to colonize the colonizers and oppress the former oppressors. But what both films offer is a term referred to by my homeboy Eris Turtle as the golden mean. Wait, is that right? It sounds like the god of war is a turtle. <laughs> the golden mean is that soft, nougaty middle ground, the balance between the two. In the case of Black Panther, it's T'Challa's willingness to forego the isolationist policies of his forebearers and let Wakanda be a beacon of light and hope for the world, helping where they can. You don't need to flip the board or seek vengeance to change the nature of things. Violence and pain begets violence and pain, and hiding serves no one. You know what else is interesting to me? The movie titles. The Dark Knight is an obvious reference to Batman being yet another juxtaposition between he and Harvey Dent the white knight of the movie, but through the lens that we're discussing it right now, the titular Dark Knight is also a reference to the Joker, who is launching his own crusade fighting for his own beliefs about justice, society, and the way he thinks that the world should work. Black Panther is no different. On one hand, it's an obvious reference to T'Challa and the part of Black Panther, the champion of Wakanda, but on the other side, through that different lens, it is also a reference to Killmonger. Follow me down this rabbit hole. One of the major themes of this film boils down to the ideals held by both parties over progress. One side holding a pacifist ideal of progress and inclusion, you know, by, by the end, while the other holds a belief in action, reaction, and violence to achieve his own end goal. And if I may be so blunt as to offer a comparison here in the United States, who do these mindset comparisons sound like to you? Pacifism versus militantism, MLK versus Malcolm X, or to be more obvious, versus the Black Panthers. So the Dark Knight is definitely about the Joker as well as Batman, both being Dark Knights just as Black Panther is about both T'Challa and Killmonger, the hero of Wakanda as well as Killmonger and his ideals both titles being references to both protagonist and antagonist simultaneously. Both films being about two different closely held viewpoints about how the world should work. The title of this movie might be Black Panther, but because of how these villains are written, this is Marvel's Dark Knight. Whew, okay, we have finally got that episode done. Uh, I've been working on that episode for way too long. Full disclosure, I think I must have rewritten that script at least four or five times, which means that I've done the voiceover work four or five times on it. Uh, the thing is, every time I reached a point where I was happy and ready to start editing the video together, and in some cases even started editing the video, I came up with something a little bit different, hopefully interesting and hopefully insightful to say about this movie. Um, the most recent being its uh, run for the Academy Awards. Now granted, it did not win Best Picture, but Black Panther, just like everything else that was nominated for Best Picture this year, did end up going home with at least one Oscar. So good for it. But admittedly, I'm sorry, I stand by everything that I said about this movie. It may not have been the best film of the year, but this film was genius in hundreds of ways that don't get discussed often enough or at all so i hope you guys really enjoyed it i hope maybe you learned the thing or two about this movie or maybe you decided to start watching this movie a little bit differently it's kind of my goal for all of the sinful analysis videos that i do for you guys um let's see what do i want to talk about real quick um oh thank you to uh all of my patrons patreon.com slash nerdy you guys can uh help keep the lights on and we do have several there's a light there's a light there's a light. There's a light down there. There's a whole bunch of lights, and these got these lights and this camera, they're all kept on by you guys, the supporters, the subscribers, and definitely our Patreon subscribers. Uh, thank you so much to those who are donating already, like uh, Ian. Gotta love Ian. He, he, he keeps things. He's 
He's the keeper that's up there. Uh, the Keep Studios, which the keeper works at. Uh, what David Duncan from Synthaholics Podcast. Synthaholics Podcast itself. And Josh. Can't forget about Josh. And the ogre. The ogre. Yeah. Um, I'm going to keep this short and sweet, guys, because quite frankly, this video was a bit long. I'll see you guys in a couple weeks for a new episode, because that episode, the editing's already almost done. So it's not going to be months until you guys' next one. We're going to make this a much more regular thing. Shooting for bi-weekly. See you then.